we join <laughs> Billy Crystal. Danny DeVito, your co-star and director, has described Throw Mama from the Train as a character comedy. You are an actor who has redefined for a lot of us comedy drama. Where does comedy drama and character comedy This is a very long question, Brian. Isn't it true? <laughs> Where does it, what, I'm sorry? Come in to your definition of Larry Donner. Um, is it fair to say comedy drama and character comedy? I think so. I think uh, ultimately when you get beyond this bizarre title uh, and the situation, it's these two guys. Um, and I think they both have uh, their own problems, so I think what you ultimately focus on with all the craziness in the movies, these, these two personalities. So I think Danny's pretty accurate in that. Uh, the comedy drama to me is always something I try to do in stand-up. When I do stand-up characters, they've always been a little less crazy than Larry Donner, under a little less pressure, but still that fine line between what's funny and what could be uh, something else. And uh, the challenge in doing Larry, because he's pretty much going crazy throughout the movie and under extreme pressure and paranoia and all of that stuff. Plus, he's, he's impotent and he's blocked from writing uh, and he's enraged most of the time. He's a fun guy. <laughs> and uh, it was to make it believable, not go over the top um, with the acting. Otherwise, you can look like a, you know, a great white in a close-up. I thought there was something wonderfully full circle, Billy, in terms of you and Larry Donner, because you were the writer who described how you had large amounts of four-page screenplays, and you would get to page four, right. it would stop, and it would be, see you next year, schmuck, it happened again. <laughs> Larry Donner gets three words down, the night was. And can't continue. I have, I have maybe 40, 54-page scripts that all say, you did it again, schmuck. <laughs> uh, now, and did you tell Stu Silver this? Oh, sure. This Stu is all between you and Stu Silver. Yeah, well, Stu and I go back a long time. Stu used to write for uh, Soap when I, was, uh, when I was playing on Soap. And Stu is he's such a good writer. Uh, and Stu has a way of writing that fits into my mouth. We say things in a different way. And he does that, and I say it. And that's it, and that's all. I mean, that's Stu. Uh, until recently, I had, I had written 40 or 50 screenplays that were four pages long four pages long. Uh, that includes a title page and then a blank page because you have to let them, you know, wait till page one. So uh, when, I, when I got involved with this, I just knew exactly what this was about. Plus, in doing stand-up, I go through huge periods of time where I'm just dry. And that's the worst feeling in the world to think that you can't write again. You'll never have a funny thought and it's over. And then the comedy police come and take you away and put you in solitary. So I knew exactly what Larry Donner was going through as far as not believing he could, he could do it. And what's odd about this movie is this little strange person, Owen Lift, brings him out of it and through this crazy circumstance, gets him to write again. I'm under the impression that Stu Silver wrote this screenplay for you. Um, this, is, this is for you. I don't think so. No? No, it was written, bef uh, he, he finished it and everything and then gave it to me, and then we tailored it after a while. But the tailoring was after Danny was involved. Now, was Danny initially approached as co-star or director? How did the two jobs come together? We, there was nobody else we, th we thought of to play Owen. Uh, I was involved with the project before Dan, and, and uh, there's a scene in the movie where I'm in a little uh, kitty train with my girlfriend, and I'm blocked and she doesn't want me to be. Like, we'll put it that way. Which she's trying to, we're trying to, as the young people say, get it on. And then there's a crunch for potato chip and we turn around and we said, well, who do we want to see in that close-up? Do we want to see who? And we said, do you want to see Danny DeVito? And we knew that Danny really wanted to direct and that he probably would not want to just act, he wanted to direct. And we said, well, we got to have that face in the close-up. And then when he came in with these wonderful ideas for for the script and for how we saw the movie well and we had not only a wonderful writer but we we knew it would be a very fine director for the for the film when and i never thought of him as a first timer that's what was amazing to me about dan was his he was so prepared and so innovative in his uh, ideas for the script and and 
and what he wanted to put into it and what he wanted to take out, sometimes very painful uh, things that, because I thought they were really funny. But it wasn't as good a movie as we ended up making. This is a very quirky, strange, very funny, rich looking movie. Um, and I give, you know, a credit to, to, to Danny and Barry Sonnenfeld. Did you tell your co-star and director, Danny DeVito, what your then professor at the NYU Film School, Martin Scorsese, told you your problem was as a director? That I was out of focus? Does well, Danny DeVito know this? <laughs> I, I wasn't directing him, so I was safe. <laughs> No, I just thought perhaps you, you are the man who, among your many skills, uh -huh. is determined to write his own material, which indeed you have done. You will direct. I mean, we're waiting for Here Comes Mr. Sleep. Hmm. We're waiting for all those things you promised. They're coming. Are they? I'm doing one now uh, that I wrote, my first screenplay that I finished, but I had help with the wonderful writer, Eric Roth, who wrote Suspect. Um, and this is something that um, we actually wrote seven years ago, and I held on to until this past year. And uh, I'm very excited about that. Um, and then next year, I'm going to do a movie in between that. And then next year, I'm going to direct the first thing that I've written, totally finished, got page past four and everything, called Here Comes Mr. Sleep. Now, what happened to your plan, the passion? for remaking The Comedian. I'm going to do, well, you have done, this is really thrilling that you have done so much research. I think this is great. I just didn't want to come all this way and wing it. <laughs> uh, the, the Comedian is a, is a, uh, was a show uh, that Mickey Rooney did on television uh, that John Frankenheimer directed. And it also co-starred Mel Torme. And um, it's, it's a comedy drama, and I'm going to redo it uh, with a character that I do named Buddy Young Jr., who I think is the best thing I've ever done. For me, it's the favorite character. It's not Fernando or Sammy's an impression or uh, the black baseball player that I really love doing also, Leonard Willoughby, who was 75 year ball player. This Buddy Young Jr., to me, is the best acting I've ever done. And uh, <clears throat> I want to do that show very badly, so I'll, I'll do that too. It's just some. It's just really nice now that people say yes to your plans. It's good. So it doesn't matter that Ron Howard refused to see you for Splash? Not anymore. Does one get over that, truly? Um, when you would have been interesting had you been allowed to meet with Ron Howard to even discuss the possibility. Yeah, I was told I wasn't the right type. They didn't even want to see me. And I, I didn't know Tom Hanks at the time. I had not seen the, the television show. And I thought, well, we're not that far off. You know, I wasn't even... But look, that's that. This Did you is mention now. Mel Torme a minute ago because Mel Torme was on the Commodore label? No. Is it loyalty forever? No, it's not. No, I... Uh, it's just that Mel was in it, and he was quite good as Mickey Rooney's uh, brother, who he slapped Charles. What was the one that Dick Van Dyke did? Was it called The Clown? No, it was called The, the Comic. The Comic. Carl Reiner directed. Uh, it's different. That was about a silent film star, loosely based on uh, Stan Laurel and Harold Lloyd. Uh, the Comedian is about a vicious 1950s comic live television show. Um, who uh, just is tormenting his staff, and then this intrigue within that, Edmund O'Brien and all these, it's really beautifully done. Um, and I just think that Buddy Young had, there's a story about a sort of, it's a combination of Requiem for Heavyweight and the comedian, sort of Requiem for a comedian. Uh, Buddy's a very sad but very funny character. I, I want to write this original drama and do live drama in the studio and recreate a 1950s feel. You know, as a member of the audience at Massey Hall, in Toronto, Canada, not that long ago, who found himself rising from his seat to acknowledge your craft and to find, as you want us to, myself moved to laughter and tears. And knowing the importance of your family and your own history in your comedy drama, what are you going to do about that extraordinary story of your grandfather Julius, who translated Hamlet into Yiddish and performed on the streets of Russia in 1905 during pogroms as his statement. Where's that? That'll be the next one. So I started, I'm on page five. Including the title page? 
Uh, I think so. It was called Your Grandpa Was a Crazy Man. I started working on it. It's a good, it's a wonderful story. Because it's real. See, that's what you do to freeze frame. See, I said, because it's real, and you freeze. I asked you. You see what I'm saying? I got you. See? I got you. I'm directing. I'm sure they got you, too. <laughs> well, listen, what did Martin Scorsese know at NYU? He'll be sorry. He was He'll so be coming intense. to you with properties. He scared the hell out of me. He was so intense. He was always, he would he scratch his mustache with three fingers this way. And he has a voice sort of like this. You had to focus. I think you're soft. I think it's soft. I think it's soft. It's soft. I don't get it. He scared the hell out of me. You know, I watch you and Danny DeVito and throw Mama from the train and see the rapport and see how touching moments are in the middle of a genuinely mad situation. The coin, you're talking about the coin scene? Yes, the yeah. coin scene is one of those moments. Yeah. His explanation of his father. I think one, it's the best written scene in the movie. And it's, I agree. Uh, we, we worked on that together with Stu. <clears throat> One night, we kept saying, this is, we need a moment here. The key in this picture is that Larry Donna will not kill Mama, that he's there to save her life and to help Owen not do this. I mean, that's very important. And people understand that Larry's a human being who's not going to do this, but he's got to save her, which he tells her in the pillow scene. And Stu went off, Stu can write very quickly, and went off and came back with a draft pretty much intact uh, of the coin scene. And we just all laughed and, 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 and felt that that's the moment that Larry looks at Owen and says, it's not a bad guy, I have to save this guy. And I just put the button on it. And this is all change that your father, let's keep the change. Yeah, it's all the change my father let me keep. And just, it's, throughout all the great camera work and all the craziness, you have two guys in one shot and a two shot talking. And that's, that's, and it's gold. And on that, let us take a commercial break and look at a scene from Throw Mama from the Train. Okay, wait, freeze frame. City Lights returns with Billy Crystal in Throw Mama from the Train, right after this. Did that freeze long enough? City Lights on location. What are you smiling at? My God, it's just, um, I worked last night till 4 a.m. It took two hours to get here, two and a half hours. Because the driver was looking for Vivian Vance's house. <laughs> and um, I get here, and, and uh, you're amazingly prepared. And it's, I'm just a little batty, but I'm, it's, it's great. Because half the time they ask, you know, you could just put anybody else here who knew the facts, and you can answer questions, but you, you're doing very well. You cut this. But... Billy, no, 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 listen. This, you will see this in its entirety. I just want you to know that for me to, for me to sit in front of an artist that I respect and know, that among the many movies you saw as a kid, one was Shane, and at the time you happened to be sitting in Billie Holiday's lap. I was sitting in Billie Holiday's lap. I mean, that's a film buff and music enthusiast dream, that you should have seen Shane sitting in Billie but Holiday's lap. But I didn't lap. know who she, you know, it, it, she was there. My dad was producing concerts, jazz concerts, and, and they were all there. I didn't know who anybody was, the, their importance, till, till way after she had passed away. And it was that, she used to call me Mr. Billy, and she was Miss Billy, and there, she's riding off, Alan Ladd, and come back, Shane, 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 Mom wants you, wants you, wants you, come back. And I remember her saying, he ain't never coming back. No way, that's it, bye, bye, Shane. <laughs> Billy, has anyone with all the success and all that's happening to you now ever given you a greater professional compliment than Chuck Mangione did when you walked off stage late as an opening act for Chuck Mangione? I, uh, you know, the rule, that was a beauty. That's one of my favorites. Uh, I grew up in this business, um, in the jazz world. I mean, and there were all of these great black artists, white artists, they were just, these, they were jazz men. And I was a jazz baby. And, um, they made me want to perform. I mean, that's the reason I do what I do, is these guys because they loved what they do, and I love what I do. And uh, I, I overstayed my welcome as an opening act. I just started, and it was, you know, do 18 to 20 minutes and get off. And I got on a roll, and I did 45, I think it was. And there was Chuck with a hat and then stuff, and I walked off, and I said, I'm really sorry. And he goes, hey, man, it's cool. You talk jazz. And it, to me, it's like the, it's the nicest thing that anyone's ever said. 
I compliment you on your work and throw Mama from the train. Thank you. I hope you return to Toronto, Canada. I, it was one of the nicest nights I've ever had. Are people, we good people? Not only are you, you great people, you're smart people. To, to do stand-up in front of an, an audience in Toronto was very difficult because they are so good and they're so bright. It was an electric night for me. Um, to play that hall, which also has seen some great jazz concerts. Um, and the, the sound in that room was, when I came off that show, I was high for three days because it, it was so appreciative and so uh, there that it made me better, it made me much better because I had to be smarter. And the stuff that is good, they know it was good. And the stuff that was better, they made you know it was better. So it was, it was really terrific. Billy, that's what happens in a city that's been weaned on Marty Short, Andrea Martin, John Cathy, you, John Cathy? Candy. Candy. All of them. SCTV. They were waiting for you. Well, I was glad to be here. I've enjoyed meeting you. Freeze frame. Thank you. Mm -hmm.